All right. My name's uh, Chris Morano. Um, I'm an herbalist. What I'd like to do is spend about a third of this talking about my formative years, how the different things influenced me. Mostly just to show you that, just like all of you, I grew up in a place. I had influences. I had easy times. I had hard times. Right? And you have no idea what's going on. You're just doing what you're supposed to do because people tell you. So I just tell you what I do now so that you can see how this is sustainable. Because you may not even understand or see how I see clearly in my mind how this is sustainable. So um, that's not even false. This is my earliest memory. I got here when I was four years old. My earliest huge memory. Four years old, got to Niagara Falls, got blown away. It's huge if you've never been there. It just blew me away that something could be so big and beautiful and powerful. And the other half of that was my mom read me a sign saying that someday this was all going to be gone because of erosion. And I remember when I was four years old crying about that. It was like, how could something so huge and so big and so powerful someday disappear? Somehow that deeply affected me. And I wove that into my story. That's like one of the first memories of my story, right? I saw really clearly at an early age, at least in my adult mind now, that the world is big and beautiful and also impermanent. And things change all the time. And there's the Black Hills in the western part of South Dakota, which is also the same hills where they carved out Mount Rushmore. Which if you've never seen Mount Rushmore, it's like blow away impressive. It's just huge busts of four famous presidents. And there I was, 10 years old, looking up at this going, wow, this is amazing. And then later on that day, we went for a hike in these kinds of mountains. And something deeply affected me there. I was so moved by the power. And at this point, if I had known the word, I would have used it. The sacredness of this land that I couldn't go back the next day. The next day, my parents said, because my brothers wanted to, let's go back and see Mount Rushmore again. I was like, I don't want to go there. How dare they use TNT to blow up the side of these sacred hills? And maybe about eight years later did I find out that these truly were sacred hills for the Native Americans living in that area. And they were deeply offended and wounded to the core when we decided to carve the faces of four pretty good men, I think, you know, the President of the United States. I wound up minoring in Eastern philosophy, Chinese philosophy, Taoism, and Buddhism, and this is New York City, so a lot of things are available. I slipped on one of those cosmic banana peels and fell into the lap of this man, uh, Master Shen Yan, a Shifu Shen Yan, Shifu means teacher father. He's a Buddhist master, a scholar, and I wound up Almost shaving my head to become a monk. I don't know, a monk. <laughs> Almost became a monk. I wound up going on dozens and dozens of meditation retreats, writing books for him, understanding Chinese philosophy to its core, I think, Taoism, Buddhism. When I was in my late 20s, I slipped again on another banana peel into the lap of a Cherokee based community. And um, that's a medicine wheel. Right. Again, kind of self-explanatory. Right. I fell into the lap of this Cherokee medicine man who wound up teaching me all these things. So now it's sweat lodges and pipe ceremonies and coming at the world from a completely different point of view. The Buddhist world was very mind-oriented. Now I'm getting very heart-oriented and coming back to my first original love, which was to be with nature. Because it was all about being and walking the good red road, being really conscious of how you walk on the earth and what kind of an impact you make. I was 35 years old and I moved up to Wendell, Massachusetts. I again slipped on another banana peel. It's about a half an hour from here. And then suddenly I was like, nobody knows me here. I can be and do whatever I want. And I want to be an herbalist. And here was the nice thing about being an herbalist. You know, nobody knows what it is. <laughs> I, can, I can do whatever I want. I can craft anything I want to be. All right? And there aren't too many er full time, not doing anything else but herbalists or herbalists in this country. All right? Usually, it's not a well-paying job. 
most people are saying, I don't even know what you're talking about. And then if you get that far, then they're saying, I don't believe it. And then if you get that far, it's like, well, does insurance cover it? Which it doesn't because it's, in, it's not something that's recognized by the insurance company. So it's like, so why should I pay you when I can get it free from somebody else? So I had all of these things up against me. And yet it was like, but this is what my soul, this is what makes my spirit really soar. This is what makes me feel good. And then my last teachers were the plants themselves. All right, I just went out into nature and I started working with the plants. All of these plants are common weeds. They're all medicines. Now when I look outside, it's a medicine chest. All right, that's plantain in the lower right. That's yarrow in the upper right. That's mullein with the long stalk. That's dandelion. And way up there, that's a common garden flower bee balm. All of these are medicines. All of these are growing here without our help. All of these help people. And it's amazing. Every day I wake up and I look outside and I say, what a medicine chest. What an amazing, abundant world we live in. And they are my teachers. Like in Native American medicine, the plants are our elders and our teachers. We shouldn't think of them as resources. We should think of them as gifts. And actually, they are our teachers. And I believe that to my core. OK, so now, coming up to the end. This is what I do. I crafted a sustainable life for myself, I think. I am, like I said, the name of my company is Clear Path Herbals. That was a name given to me by my teacher. I don't know how to say it in Chinese, but when you translate it into English, my name is Clear Path. So I thought, it's like a good company name. I'll be Clear Path Herbals. And I wear three feathers in my business hat. Because you have to make a living. I have to pay Verizon. Verizon doesn't bar. I can't say you want some dandelion tincture for last night's phone call. They don't go for it. Okay. So um, I have a school. I have a wellness and health practice. And I make all my own medicines. I don't send people to the stores to get their stuff unless it's something I don't have. The school of herbal medicine, I want to train other people to do this. What I want to train is a bunch of activated community herbalists. People who might not necessarily make a full-time job out of this, because believe me, it's not that easy. But you can be of use to other people who are living nearby you, and you might be able to make a living from it, at least a partial living, maybe a total living out of it. And I guarantee you, you're going to feel good about yourself, because you're helping other people, you're not trashing the environment to do it, and everything you do is hopefully in step with what the Native Americans call the Good Red Road, or what the Buddhists call the Eightfold Path, which means living in as great a harmony as you can with existence, with yourself, with other people. So I want to have as many community herbalists trained so that if the shit does hit the fan, and we are isolated and separated from the powers that be, being able to disseminate drugs and stuff to us, that we can go outside and say, I know how to help people. The medicines are right here. And the Cherokee said a long time ago, the plants made a pact with the human world and said that every illness and disease that evolves on your planet, there will be plants to match it. And I believe that. So now we have Lyme disease. And we also have Japanese knotweed, which if you're a native plant enthusiast, you can't stand the plant. But guess what? It's an absolutely beautiful plant. It helps with Lyme disease. It cures third degree burns. It's edible. The bees love it. I don't <coughs> ignore those things. You know, it all matters. But my job is to kind of help people say, you know that drummer you've been listening to all these years and decades and centuries? It's an unsustainable drum beat. The drum beat you should be listening to is the guy in Earth drum beat. That's the one that's sustainable. So hop over here. And every time I train a community herbalist, that happens. Okay.